2 Kings 18, 1 to 6, we're going to finish our discussion of Hezekiah's reforms, and then we're going to talk about Christmas. And uh, we're going to entitle this Christmas God's View. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshiah, Hoshiah the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Avi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places, broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Neheshton. He trusted the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. He held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Now we discussed a number of things, and we're going to... I just want you to note, before we start discussing things about Christmas, that Hezekiah was explicitly following the law of God. He was acting according to the law of Moses in every one of his reforms. This is from Deuteronomy 12, 1 to 7. These are the statutes and judgments which you, which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. Now listen to this. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. But you shall seek the place where the Lord God your chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your, land, of your hand, your vowed offerings, your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your households, in which the Lord God has blessed you. <coughs> all the places sacred to the Canaanites, and all the religious objects, shrines, statues, poles, trees, etc., associated with pagan worship are to be cut down and completely destroyed. So these objects are to be systematically and completely, utterly abolished, destroyed, cut down, destroyed, obliterated, never to be used again. And the places associated with them are to be divested of any semblance of sanctity. There is to be no remnants of paganism or idolatry or false worship left in the land at all. That's the command. And this is what God thinks of idolatry and humanistic worship. And their problems, their backslidings, and their syncretism resulted from not obeying this part of Deuteronomy right here. They didn't obey this like they should have, and they got into trouble. The physical act of desecration was also a visible, tangible, symbolic act of rejection and repentance. It was the confession with the hands that pagan religions were evil, exceptionally sinful, non-efficacious, and highly offensive to God. The act of complete obliteration not only demonstrated repentance and removed any subsequent temptation for the Israelites to backslide, at least in the short term, it also served the purpose of obliterating the name of the false gods from, from that place forever, from all the pagan sites forever. And we're going to see when we, we're going to consider Christmas a little bit, uh, the remnants of idolatry are to be eliminated from society. <clears throat> There is only one true and living God who we approach the blood and righteousness of Christ. All other false gods and religions are to be destroyed. <clears throat> Root and branch from the nation of Israel and from a covenant, covenanted Bible-believing Christian nation. So if we have a Christian nation and there's nothing wrong with it, it's our goal, it should be our goal. There should not be pluralism. There is only one true and living God, and comp any compromise with paganism or syncretism is a rejection of the first table of the moral law. 
Syncretistic worship is a peace treaty with heathenism and an explicit repudiation of the commands in Scripture to remove the monuments of idolatry. And then number three, the king's zeal for removing idolatrous worship from uh, extended to the destruction of the bronze serpent, which God had commanded Moses to make, Numbers 21, 4 to 9, because the people treated it as an idol. Verse 4, we, we broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan, the bronze thing. 2 Kings uh, 18, 4. So we have an object 18 centuries old that had great historical interest, great sentimental value, that went all the way back to the founding of the nation and was a great symbol of salvation, of Christ's death on the cross. It had to be smashed to pieces because it became a stumbling block to the people. So we have here an important biblical teaching that even those things which are commanded by God that are lawful can be abused and used in an unlawful, superstitious manner. The broad serpent was looked upon by faith in God's command in order to be healed from the bites of the poisonous snakes. But men began to burn incense to it. They regarded it as some special religious object, and they began to worship it as an idol. In honor to God, Hezekiah had it smashed to pieces and forever destroyed as a stumbling block. <clears throat> now this reminds us of a form of idolatry and superstition that is based in part on something good and lawful, that is people today in evangelicals and reformed churches, and that is the observance of special days not commanded by the word of God. Like Christmas, and it's that season, so we're going to discuss it a little bit. The Son of the living God did come to earth. We believe in the Incarnation. He came from the throne room of heaven, was born of a virgin in Bethlehem, probably anywhere from 4 to 6 B.C. And it is also true that Jesus was born of... Uh, the Virgin Mary, but how are we, uh, as a people called out of the world, to celebrate the incarnation of Christ? What does the Bible say? Are we to have a separate special day just for the incarnation? Well, the biblical position has always been perspicuous, excellent, and wise. God has given us the Christian Sabbath, the first day of the week, or the eighth day. You know, the symbolism of the eighth day in the Old Testament is the symbol of regeneration and recreation in Christ and salvation. The first day of the week as the only day in the New Covenant era for the celebration of the whole work of Jesus' redemption. So we celebrate the whole work, including the birth of Christ, including the incarnation, every Sunday. So don't complain, oh, you want to take away my Christmas day. No, we have 52 days of the, of the year to celebrate the birth of Christ, but we celebrate the birth, the death, and the resurrection, and the ascension, everything on that day. Well, there are a number of things, reasons why Christian uh, Christmas is will worship idolatrous and evil. Number one, God has not commanded it or authorized it in his word. And I'm talking about Christmas as a separate day, uh, the church calendar. <clears throat> the Reformed position has always been that in matters of worship, we are only permitted to do that which we can prove from Scripture, except what is called circumstantial matters. What kind of chairs are we going to sit on? What color is the carpeting going to be? Uh, is our building going to be a rectangle or a square? Is it going to be a round building? What kind of lighting do we have? These are circumstantial matters. Are we going to meet at 10 or 11? These are circumstantial matters. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 12.32 is one of the several passages. I'm not going to go into it because I have a whole book on it. I have a couple books on this <clears throat> that prove this principle. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Okay, so here's what I give you. I give you these commandments. Don't add to them. Don't detract from them. Just do exactly what I tell you. And today, this is called the regular principle of worship. Lutherans, Episcopalians, Evangelicals, and unfortunately, most Reformed churches today, the vast majority, reject this, biblical, this crucial biblical principle and teach that virtually anything goes in worship unless it is explicitly forbidden. Okay, you want to have a, a drama group in your worship service, or you want to have a puppet show, or Boba the Clown, or a rock band, or whatever, go ahead. 
Well, people do not realize how permissive this concept of worship really is. Now think about it. You could have 25 sacraments if you want, as long as they're not explicitly forbidden. You could have more sacraments. That, you could have all sorts of things. You could have as many holy days as you want. You could have special saints days. I mean, you basically, if you don't have the regular principle, you're on the road to Rome. One could have theater and worship, puppet shows, rock and roll, operas, weightlifters, smashing blocks of concrete. You say, well, that's insane. Well, I saw a Pentecostal church when I was in Michigan. They had weightlifters come in during their worship service, and they ripped phone books in half, and they smashed uh, big things of concrete, and did all kinds of things, and that was part of the worship service. Ballet dancers, I've seen that, or liturgical dance, people doing uh, paintings or sculptures. Now, these things are fun, and they're not necessarily sinful. But they are sinful in God's sight when they are made elements of worship. When they're made elements of worship. <clears throat> Here's what Michael Bouchel writes. Each generation, it seems, inherits the liturgical mutations of those who went before. And without reflection, adds a few of its own. Considered individually, each generation's changes may not seem all that significant, but the cumulative effect is one of substantial, if not drastic, change. The end product of such a process is a church whose worship practices drifted far from its biblical moorings, but whose people are largely unaware of the danger that, it, they have, that have taken place. The ignorance and apathy that feed this process are two of the church's greatest weaknesses, just as they are without doubt two of Satan's most potent weapons. And they must be confronted head on if present trends are to be affected materially. A church that is unconsciously in sin is still in sin. One can only hope that apathy towards the truth is not as widespread as ignorance of it. And if you doubt me, get Philip Schaff's The History of the Church. Read about the progress of the worship of the church from the apostles to, let's say, the year 1000 and the height of Romanism. And it's just one edition after another, one edition after another. And they, they kept at it. Uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary was 1800s. And they kept adding, and they kept adding, and they kept adding. And then you get the Church of Antichrist. When God condemned idolatry in Jeremiah's day, he said, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. In other words, why are you doing this? I didn't tell you to do this. This didn't come from me. What are you doing? You shouldn't even be doing this. I didn't command this. The point here is that we should not consider doing anything in worship unless God first commands it or authorizes it. We need to understand that we have to do with a God who is infinitely holy and very jealous. If God be such a being, as we are taught in the Holy Scriptures, it must be his inalienable right to determine and prescribe how he will be worshipped. And to deny this great truth, because we like our human traditions, is supremely arrogant and foolish. It's sinful. And I know because I've had people read my Christmas book and say, oh, I love your book. You really prove your case. But I like Christmas and I'm going to keep doing it. And I usually respond by saying, well, to, if it's a guy, I'll say, well, you like looking at Playboy, don't you? You really like it, don't you? Are you going to keep doing that? No, well, no, well, no. See, there's, the problem with the church today is there's a lot of sins that are acceptable sins. <clears throat> and this point, by the way, has always been the confessional Presbyterian position. And to prove it, let's note the following historical facts. Number one. The Scottish First Book of Discipline, which is around 1560, I didn't bother to look up the date, I should have. Here it says, The keeping of holy days, and all those that the Papists have invented as the Feast of Christmas, which things, because in God's scripture they neither have commandment nor assurance, we judge them utterly to be abolished from this realm. That's the realm of Scotland. Number two, when due to public pressure, the writers of the Second Helvetic Confession <clears throat> adopted the observances or what, or what are called the church calendar, the Christian year, 
or the liturgical calendar, the Christian liturgical calendar, which, by the way, that whole idea that all that comes from Romanism. The General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in 1566 publicly rejected that, sec that section of the Second Helvetic Confession. They said, we really like what you've done, but this part about Holy Days, we utterly reject. <clears throat> Besides this serious error, this, uh, this one serious error has corrupted German and Dutch Reformed churches to this very day. Besides that, the second Helvetica is quite excellent. It's, I recommend it, but it's got that serious error. An error is an error. Number three. In conjunction with the Second Reformation in Scotland, the Glasgow Assembly of 1638 said, quote, <coughs> the Christian year was again, quote, utterly abolished because they are neither commanded nor warranted by Scripture. Act Article 17. Number four. The Directory for Public Worship of the Westminster Standard, 1645, says this, There is no day commanded in Scripture to keep holy under the gospel but the Lord's Day, which is the Christian Sabbath. Festival days, vulgarly called holy days, having no warrant in the Word of God, are not to be continued. Number five. The covenants produced by the Presbyterians, back when they were called covenanters, uh, 1580, 1638, 1647, all condemned Christmas and so called the so-called church calendar, the Christian calendar. They, they were all repudiated and condemned in the covenants. So if you keep those things, you RPCNA people, you so-called covenanters, you're covenant breakers. Number six, <clears throat> all extra biblical holy days are explicitly condemned by the Westminster Confession of Faith 21, uh, 1 and 7. 7 tells us that only the Sabbath day is the Christian Sabbath. The first day of the week is to be uh, respected and kept as a holy day. And of course, they are explicitly condemned by the larger catechism, for example, answer to question 109. Many of the large Presbyterian, larger Presbyterian bodies began to celebrate Christmas in the 1880s. Some of the smaller, stricter bodies started to celebrate Christmas after World War I. It was adopted due to cultural assimilation and social pressure, not because ministers and elders studied scripture and saw exegetical proof for it. You don't find that at all. Now, in recent years, <coughs> people like Greg Bonds and Ken Gentry, who are generally good guys, uh, have tried to argue for it. They come up with sophisticated arguments for celebrating it. Uh, the problem with those arguments is that they're totally, radically unscriptural. Radically unscriptural. <clears throat> the Puritans in New England and the early Presbyterians in Scotland all regarded celebrating Christmas as a scandalous sin meriting church discipline. And uh, it was illegal. It was a civil law against it in Scotland and Puritan New England, and you would be arrested for celebrating Christmas. They regarded it as a pagan popish day, a violation of God's law. There are no commands in Scripture to celebrate Christmas, or Jesus' birth as a separate festival day, and there are no historical examples of Christians uh, celebrating an annual festival, festival day of Christ's birth. Now, some have argued, uh, you know, I didn't go into objections, but some have argued, well, the angels celebrated the birth of Christ, didn't they? Well, <clears throat> they indeed did. They had celebrated the Incarnation. But the praise of Jesus by the angels at the Incarnation was a one-time historical event in salvation history, and it does not teach or imply a special church calendar. If you're going to start using that to justify a separate festival day called Christmas, then you should have a special day for when Israel was liberated. You should have a special day when Joshua defeated the Canaanites here. You could, have spe you could use that argument for an in infinite number of days virtually. If God wanted us to celebrate Jesus' birthday as an annual holy day, he could have easily told us to do so by a commander example in the word of God. The fact that the exact day of Jesus' birth is unknown, it's not known, nobody knows, and that December is actually the least likely time, if we look at the circumstances, it makes it clear that only the Christian Sabbath is to be regarded and celebrated as holy. 
We celebrate Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, Pentecost, etc. 52 days every year. Make the Sabbath more special. You don't need Christmas. Because Christmas is a man-invented day, it is humanistic and it glorifies man, not God. That is why Christmas is so popular with secular humanists, sodomites, feminists, cross-dressers, and rank idolaters. The Japanese added Santa as one of their gods. And the Japanese is the most non-Christian nation in the world. By obeying the Christian Sabbath, which is authorized by God, it is commanded by God, we honor and worship Jesus Christ and his work of redemption. We're obeying the scriptures. By celebrating Christmas, which is a human invention, we don't honor God, he didn't command it, and we commit sin. We commit the sin, the sin of Eve in the garden. Remember, Satan told her, hey, you don't need God to tell you what to do. You can come up with ethics yourself. You can determine for yourself what is good and what is evil. The sin of autonomy, which says, I will define what God wants and what pleases uh, him, apart from the word of God. That's what you're doing when you're celebrating Christmas. You're agreeing with Eve's sin in the garden. I will call the shots, not Christ, not God. To celebrate Christmas is a bowing down to human authority, to a Romanist concept of the authority of human tradition. Evangelicals and many Reformed people in our day reject the sanctity of the first day of the week, the Christian Sabbath. They do. They work and play as if the Sabbath was abrogated. The evangelicals explicitly believe it's abrogated. Reformed people just kind of don't keep it anyway. They work and play as if the Sabbath didn't exist. But Christmas, a pagan, popish, humanistic invention, is given special reverence. There's a guy around who has got a great show, a gardening show. He's got a great gardening show. And he emphasized in his show... Uh, uh, and he has a show on Sunday, but he, he emphasized, oh, I never have a show on Christmas. Christmas is special. On Christmas, almost everything is closed. But the Sabbath, everything is open. Almost everything. And people make a special effort on Christmas to be with their families, to have a meal together. The humanistic pagan day is treated as special, as a real holy day. While the only day that God has authorized, the first day of the week, the Christian Sabbath, the day of resurrection, is treated as common or profane by everybody, by virtually everybody. Beloved, this behavior is wicked. It dishonors the Lord Jesus Christ. When professing Christians make a humanistic, pagan, popish, non-commanded day more special than the day that God has commanded, that God has authorized in the word of God, they reveal a great degree of backsliding of accommodating this evil world. Christmas is worldly. It is satanic. It is sinful. We must analyze Christmas biblically, not emotionally, not using the lens of sentimentality, not pragmatically. Because if you're going to be sentimental, if you're going to be emotional, if you're going to be pragmatic, you could justify all kinds of sins. Liberals, Protestant liberals, justify adultery. They justify sodomy and homosexual behavior using concept of emotions and sentimentality. It's no different. Don't do it. Stick to the word of God. And then number two. Christmas violates a crucial biblical principle that God's people have a moral responsibility, and we saw this very clearly this morning in our study of Hezekiah's reforms, to do everything within their power to eliminate all the monuments to past and present idolatry from their family, from their church, and in a Christian nation, the state. And these assertions are easy to prove. The day that Christmas is celebrated, and if you don't believe me, just look the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Encyclopedia Americana, the World Book, look at all the encyclopedias, look at all the reference works, and they all talk about Christmas totally being or originated in paganism. The day, December 25th, or that week, and nearly all the customs associated with Christmas had their origin in pagan idolatry. Here's the Encyclopedia Britannica. 
quote, many of Earth's inhabitants were sun worshippers because the course of their lives depended on its yearly round in the heavens. The fe and feasts were held to aid its return from distant wanderings. In the south of Europe, in Egypt and Persia, the, gods, the sun gods were worshipped with elaborate ceremonies in the season of the winter solstice as a fitting time to pay tribute to the benign god of plenty, while in Rome the Saturnalia reigned for a whole week. And that would be from around December 21st to 28th, right in there. In northern lands, mid-December was a critical time, for the days became shorter and shorter, and the sun was weak and far away. Thus these ancient peoples held feast days at the same period that Christmas is now observed, end of quote. During the winter solstice, the Babylonians worship Tammuz. The Greeks and Romans worship Jupiter, Mithra, Saturn, Hercules, Bacchus, and Adon Adonis. The Egyptians worship Osiris and Horus. The Scandinavians worshiped Odin. Among the German and Celtic tribes, the winter solstice was considered an important part of the year. And they held their chief festival of Yule to commemorate the return of the burning wheel. The holly, the mistletoe, the Yule log, and the vassal bowl are relics of pre-Christian times. And here's what Alexander Hislop writes. And he's somebody that James Jordan loves to hate, so he must be really good. <clears throat> Quote, long before the 4th century and long before the Christian era itself, a festival was celebrated among the heathen at that precise time of the year in honor of the birth of the son of the Babylonian queen of heaven. And that's Tammuz. And it may fairly presume that in order to con conciliate the heathen and to swell the numbers of the nominal adherence of Christianity, the same festival was adopted by the Roman Church, giving it only the name of Christ. And if you don't like Hislop, who's a pretty good scholar, uh, how about uh, Philip Schaff? <clears throat> and by the way, these people in the, in the encyclopedias, none of them are Christians, they're not Christians. And Philip Schaff is a Lutheran who celebrates the Christian year, so he, doesn't have, he does not have an axe to grind against Christmas. Here's what Philip Schaff writes. <clears throat> The Christmas festival was probably the Christian transformation or regeneration of a series of kindred heathen festivals, Saturnalia, Sigalia, Juvenalia, and Brumalia, which were kept in Rome in the month of December in commemoration of the golden age of universal freedom and equality, and in honor of the unconquered sun, and which were great holidays, especially for slaves and children. This connection accounts for the many customs of the Christmas season, like the giving of presents to the children and to the poor, the lighting of wax tapers, perhaps also the erection of Christmas trees, and gives them a Christian import, while it also betrays the origin of many of the excesses in which the unbelieving world indulge in the season, and wanton perversion of the true Christian mirth, in which, of course, no more forbid right use than the abusers of the Bible or any other gift of God. Had the Christmas festival arisen in the period of persecution, its derivation from these pagan festivals would be refined by the, by the then reigning abhorrence of everything heathen, but in the Nicene Age, this rigidness of opposition between church and the world was in great measure softened by the general conversion of the heathen. End of quote. Was Christmas celebrated by Jesus Christ or by the apostles or by the apostolic church? The answer is absolutely not. There's not a shred of evidence for it. It was not celebrated during the first few centuries of the church. As late as AD, 4, uh, AD 250. 45, Origen, homily 8 on Leviticus, reputes the idea of keeping the birthday of Christ as if he were King Pharaoh. By the middle of the 4th century, many churches in the Latin West were celebrating Christmas. So it comes in pretty late. And here's what Philip Schaff says. And anything related to worship, anything related to religion or Christ, that comes in long after the death of the apostles, we know it can't be biblical. Because it's barely, it's human tradition, it's based on human authority. Here's what Philip Schaff writes. Notwithstanding the deep significance and wide popularity, the festival of the birth of the Lord is of comparatively late institution. The Feast of Epiphany had spread from the east to the west. The Feast of Christmas took the opposite course. We find it first in Rome at the time of Bishop Liberius, who on the 25th of December, 360, consecrated Marcella, the sister of St. Ambrose, nun or the bride of Christ, and addressed her with the words, Thou seest what multitudes are come to the birth festival of thy bridegroom. Ambrose, Diversion 2, number 1. The passage implies that the festival was already existing and familiar. Christmas was introduced in Antioch about the year 380. In Alexandria, where the Feast of the Epiphany was celebrated as the Nativity of Christ, not till about 430. 
Chris Austin, who delivered the Christmas homily in Antioch on the 25th of December, 386 already calls it, notwithstanding its recent introduction, some 10 years before, the fundamental feast or the root from which all other Christian festivals grow forth. So it came in the 4th century, primarily. During the 5th century, Christmas became an official Roman Catholic Holy Day. In AD 534, Christmas was recognized an official Holy Day by the Roman state. An expert in ancient worship, and he's not, he doesn't have an axe to grind, he doesn't think there's anything wrong with Christmas. This is a scholar named Herman Wegman. He's got a really good book on the ancient worship of the church. Quote, the oldest mention of Christmas, December 25th, as a Christian feast day, is found in the West at Rome in the chronography of 354, based on a calendar that goes back to 336. Thus, Christmas may have been known in Rome by 330 or a little earlier. There may have been some connection with the building of St. Peter's on the Vatican Hill, where in one of the tombs, a mosaic of Christ as the sole Eustia, the son of righteousness, and the son is spelled S-U-N, has been discovered. The texts of Christmas often refer to Christ as the light of the world and the son of righteousness. In any case, it is practically certain that Christmas in Rome originated as a Christmas, Christmas appendage, or perhaps replacement of the pagan Natalis Invicti, the feast of the unconquered sun at the winter solstice. The syncretistic ideas of the Emperor Constantine may also have been related to its development, to this development. It appears that the festival of Christmas was adopted in the East from Rome, probably in the late qu last quarter of the 4th century in Constantinople and the middle of the 5th century in Egypt. End of quote. So, the reason that Christmas exists and the reason that Christmas became a church holy day has nothing to do with the Bible, does it? Nothing to do with the Bible. The Bible does not give the date of Christ's birth. The day and month of the birth of Christ are nowhere stated in the gospel history and cannot be determined uh, with any certainty. And according to the writers of the Talmud, this is from the Talmud, the flocks in Palestine were brought in at the beginning of November and not driven to pasture again until March. So from November to March, Christ wasn't born. December is the least likely month. Therefore, the date of December 25th is a direct conflict with Luke 2.8. Nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to celebrate Christmas. Christmas, as well as many, any other pagan practices, was adopted by the Roman Catholic Church as a missionary strategy. Syncretism with paganism was a deliberate strategy of the church at that time. It was a missionary strategy. And it's clearly revealed by Pope Gregory I's instructions to missionaries, given in A.D. 601. Listen to this. This is from Bede's history, by the way. Bede's ecclesiastical history says this. Because they, that is the pagans, were wont to sacrifice oxen to devils, some celebration should be given in exchange for this. They should celebrate a religious feast and worship God by their feasting, so that they, still keeping their outward pleasures, they may more readily receive spiritual joys. End of quote. So we have something, it's not commanded, it doesn't originate until after 300, around 336, about the earliest, not commanded, and it's totally saturated with paganism. The secretive of paganism explains why uh, Christian customs are pagan to the core. The Christmas tree came into use because sacred trees were an important part of the pagan worship during the winter solstice season. In Babylon, the evergreen tree represented Nimrod coming into to life again in Tammuz, the queen of Babylon. Tammuz was supposedly born of a virgin, Samarius. In Rome, they decorated fir trees with berries to celebrate Saturnalia. The Scandinavians brought in a sacred fir tree into their homes in honor of the god Odin or Woden. When the pagans of Northern Europe became Christians, they made their sacred evergreen trees part of the Christmas festival. And they decorated the trees with gilded nuts, candles, they carry over from the sun worship, and apples to stand for the star, sun, moon, and stars. The lighting of sacred fires and candles on December 24th and 25th are practices that originated in sun worship. The use of the Yule log probably originated with Druid sun worship. The log would not be allowed to burn and would be used again the next year's, in next year's fire, probably as a symbol of the sun's rebirth. The, the fire would go out and they would save the log until the next December. The Romans 
ornamented their temples and homes with green bows and flowers for the Saturnalia. Their season of merrymaking giving of presents. The Druids gathered mistletoe with great ceremony and hung it in their homes. The Saxons used holly, ivy, and bay. The fact that Christmas is so full of paganism and is is it's universally recognized. You can buy secular books on Christmas and they discuss all this. It's not even in doubt. Yet what do Christians say? Well, yeah, we know it comes from paganism, but we don't give any credence to these pagan connotations. Our observance of Christmas is, uh, it, it provides us with an opportunity to to look at Christian, to look at these pagan things from a Christian perspective, and even Doug Wilson, the venerable Doug Wilson, who's uh, adopted a heretical view of justification called the Federal Vision, um, and he openly rejects the regular principle. Yet he continues to call himself a Puritan somehow. Uh, he says, "We bring the evergreen tree in our homes, and we take dominion over the evergreen tree." He said that in his magazine. Uh, well, what did we read in the Bible? And we're going to get to that. The pagan outlook of it the pagan monuments. They didn't take the evergreen, they didn't take paganism into their home, they destroyed it. Now many Christians argue that you do not worship the Christmas tree and that the pagan origins are so far in the past as to be harmless and insignificant. But such a view I common in our day shows a total disregard of biblical teaching regarding our idolatry, the paraphernalia associated to idolatry, and the monuments to idolatry. And the fact that it's still idolatry to Roman Catholics it's not ancient idolatry. It's still current idolatry. So you can't say, well, it's 5,000 years ago. God has such a strong hatred of idolatry that Israel was commanded to avoid the worship of idols. Israel was also specifically ordered to destroy everything associated with idolatry. And I read this earlier, Deuteronomy 12, 2 to 4, and 3 to 31. You shall utterly destroy all the places, all the places where the nations which you shall display serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and every underground tree. You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, burn down their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved image of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. And you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? I will likewise do the same. You shall worship the Lord God. You shall not worship the Lord God in that way. In other words, we're not to take anything pagan. Even, you know, we know that there's nothing, uh, you know, things like evergreens and mistletoe and all these things associated with Christmas. We know that intrinsically, we know gods don't exist. We know that they're, they're not significant. However, God says anything associated with idolatry, banish it in honor of me. I don't want it around. When Jacob set to pur purify the camp, his household and the attendants, the earrings were removed as well as their foreign gods because their earrings were associated with their false gods. Genesis 35, 1 to 4. They were signs of superstition. When Elijah went to offer a sacrifice in the contest of the prophets of Baal, he didn't use their pagan altar. He did not take something made for idols, for Saturnalia, and attempt to sanctify it for holy use, Christmas. But instead he re rebuilt the Lord's altar from scratch. Christians should not take the pagan festival of Yule or Saturnalia and dress it up with Christian clothing, but rather sanctify the Lord's Day as did the apostles, 1 Kings 18.32. When Jehu went against the worshippers of Baal in their temple, he did not save the temple and set it apart for holy use. He slaughtered the worshippers of Baal, and then he broke down the sacred pillars of Baal and tore down the temple of Baal and made it a garbage dump to this very day, 2 Kings 10.27. And we have the example of good Josiah, 2 Kings 23. He did not only destroy the houses and the high places of Baal, but the vessels also, the groves, the altars, the horses, the chariots, which had been given to the sun. And there's the example of penitent Manasseh, who not only overthrew the strange gods, but their altars, 2 Chronicles 23, 15. And Moses, the man of God, who was not content to execute vengeance on the idolatrous Israel, except he should utterly destroy the monuments of their idolatry. So, does God want us to take that which is pagan and try to sanctify it and make it holy and Christianize it? No. Get rid of it. Obliterate it. Don't do it. He gives us a Sabbath. Here's an illustration. If your wife was promiscuous before you married her, 
Would you be offended if she had uh, decorated her house with pictures of her old boyfriends? And she would wear the necklace he gave her and rings that he gave her and have that stuff laying around the house. Would you be offended by that or would you want her to get rid of all that? It's a very good illustration. Because Christmas is spiritual adultery. It's a form of idolatry. Is it as bad as worshipping a statue of Baal? Obviously not, but it's a form of idolatry. Could Israel make these pagan things acceptable to God? The answer is absolutely not. God makes itself very clear. And then, <clears throat> we want to note one last thing, point number three. Christmas is a lie. I'll never forget, I was witnessing to a, I worked at an old folks home in, in the early, early 90s, and I was witnessing to a guy who was 80 years old. And he said, well, you guys believe in the Easter Bunny and Christmas and Santa Claus. Why should I believe the resurrection? When Christians start mixing mythology and lies with the truth, they do themselves a huge disservice and they offend God. Christianity is the religion of truth. God cannot lie. All truth and all knowledge ultimately comes from God. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth, John 16, 13. The Gospel is called the Word of Truth, Ephesians 1, 13. God commands, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, Exodus 20, 16. And Paul tells us to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. To put away lying and speak the truth to our neighbor in order not to grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4, 25, and 30. Jesus Christ tells us that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. <clears throat> We're told by Christ to be a salt and light to the world, Matthew 5, 13 and 16. We are to be a witness before the world by spreading the truth, speaking the truth, living the truth. Is celebrating Christmas co compatible with your responsibility to speak the truth in love before the world? And the answer is absolutely not, because Christmas is a lie. Jesus was not born in December. Jesus was not born on December 25th. The date used to celebrate the birth of Christ, December 25th, is a lie. According to the Bible, Jesus was not born on December. Now, we don't know the exact date, but we do know he wasn't born on December 25th. I covered this earlier, just I'll be brief. Luke 2.8. And there were some in the country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. It is common knowledge that the shepherds in Palestine came in from the fields before winter. The rainy season, and we're not talking about just rain, it's cold and wet, and it rains a lot, begins in late October or early November, and it runs all through December. The shepherds are bringing their, uh, their uh, field flocks into the village before the beginning of the rainy season. Remember, they didn't have nice tents and houses out in the hills. They were out laying on the ground with the sheep. Therefore, Christ was born before the first week of November. It is quite evident that Christ was not born in the middle of winter. But on the other hand, do the scriptures teach us or tell us <coughs> what season of the year he was born? Yes, I think the scriptures indicate that he was very likely born in the fall of the year. For example, our Lord's public ministry lasted for three and a half years, Daniel 9.27. Then his ministry came to an end at the end of Passover, John 18.39, which was when? The spring of the year. Passover was the spring. <clears throat> so three and a half years before this would mark the beginning of Jesus' ministry, in the fall of the year. Now when Jesus began his ministry, he was about 30 years of age, Luke 3.23, and of course 30 years of age, was the recognized year where you could begin the priesthood and you could begin serving as an elder, an official minister in the Old Testament, Numbers 4.3. Therefore, since Christ began his ministry at the age of 30, since this, was, would, this would place his birth in the fall of the year, then 30 years before, uh, anyway, 30 years before, three and a half years, crucifixion, 30 years before that, the fall, you, you get the fall of the year, not December 25th. If Christians were willing to, and even if you disagree with that, and that's the scriptural evidence, the scriptural evidence all points to the fall. Even if you deny the scriptural evidence, 
we don't make up stuff about Jesus. We, we don't make up a date about Jesus. You don't, you don't, if you don't know it to be true, you don't make it up. If, Christmas, if Christians are willing to continue, celebrate a lie and fill Christ's sham birthday with papist and popist mythology, Santa Claus, the Christmas tree, the mistletoe, the Yule log, the evergreens, then why should the world believe the church when it really speaks the truth about the gospel? If you lie about the birth of Christ and gladly indulge in a pagan mythology, then when you tell your neighbor about the re resurrection of Christ, why should he believe you? By celebrating Christmas, you are putting a stumbling block in front of your unbelieving neighbors. Your neighbors would reason that since you speak a lie regarding the birth of Christ, you cannot be trusted when you speak about the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> and you say, well, heck, everybody loves Christmas. Well, that's another reason why we shouldn't celebrate it, is it? The world loves Christmas. Does the world love the Sabbath and obey the Sabbath? No, it's NFL day. It's sports day. It's beach day. It's, it's snow skiing day. It's not, it's not the Christian Sabbath anymore. It's society, like it used to be. So I hope you see. Now, I understand. I was raised Roman Catholic in a German family where we totally got into Christmas like you wouldn't believe. And it was fun. I'm not against Christmas. I'm not saying Christmas isn't fun. But smoking dope is fun. Snorting cocaine is fun, too. That doesn't make it lawful. The fact that people like something doesn't make it lawful. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Are you willing to submit to Scripture or not? Are you willing to have 52 holy days a year and make that special and forget about this stupid pagan day that was invented by the Church of Rome, by Antichrist? Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your word. I know that there are times when all of society says one thing and we have to do the other. So give us the strength to be obedient in this area, especially those who are accustomed to this satanic trash. In Jesus' name.